Thank you. So it's a great, great pleasure to welcome you all to this session uh, on DHS2 data in research. And uh, my name is Johan Sabe. I'm, uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Oslo. I've been working with DHIS implementations for almost 20 years, but as a researcher now, I'm, I'm also very interested in um, actually how DHIS2 can support health services uh, in both more traditional and in novel ways. So it was really good to see uh, abstracts submitted that uh, wanted to talk about uh, topics around, around this theme. So we have made this session now based on some um, input from a big uh, HISP network and, and uh, very glad to see also, you know, people that we don't really work that closely with having so much interesting to say about uh, use of DHIS2 and use of the data coming through systems running on DHIS2. So we have three speakers today or, or four speakers for three presentations. And we'll start by uh, listening to Yangtze Sherpa presenting on improving the usage of DHIS2 platform sharing, or sharing on community experience of Surke district in Nepal. Then Yangshi is followed by Emily Yelverton and Mitali Ayangar from DataKind with their presentation on program evaluation in resource limited environments, a demonstration of a novel machine learning approach to deriving actionable insights from DHIS2 health data for healthcare intervention management. And the third speaker today is Luis Tina Day from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine on the Every newborn birth indicator research tracking and hospital study. So I will put in the chat again um, a link to the community page for this session where you can post your questions. You can also post them in uh, the chat or raise your hand um, to, to ask your questions in person at the end of the session. So we're going to run the three presentations uh, in one row first, and then we open up for, for questions. To all the presenters. So then I'm, I'm very happy to give the word to, to Yangtze as the first presenter. Thank you, Yangtze. Thank you, John. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, that ISP group and team members for these great initiations, uh, that this uh, HISP movement has come beyond the software application to the broader uh, socio-technical ecosystem of health information system. So I will be focusing on my presentations, uh, mostly on the aspects of health information system, uh, which includes people, competences, institution, and practices. So uh, overall, it is the community experience of Surke district of Nepal. So let me begin with my introductions. I'm Yangzi Sherpa. I worked for Apt Associate Inc. as a, a health information a technical officer uh, and currently working in Lumini province of Nepal. Uh, so let me begin with my presentation. So I will, uh, uh, this is the outline of my presentations. I will walk you through the background of uh, Nepal health system, uh, linking with uh, health information system and DHIS2. Uh, and then with the introduction of uh, strengthening system for better health activity, with the approaches used for the usage of DHIS2. Uh, some of the findings I will share and uh, relating with the results uh, from the community practice along with the challenges and recommendation. So this is the organogram of Nepal health system. Uh, currently, there is three tiers of government uh, that is functioning in Nepal. So Ministry of Health and Populations is the lead in federal government. Uh, so Ministry of Social Development in the provincial government. Uh, likewise, under these government are different local bodies, uh, which is uh, functioning to provide basic health services. So in terms of uh, health information system also, 
uh, this three tiers government is uh, functioning, but uh, the federal government is still the commanding authority to provide technical guidance to provincial and local government. Uh, so Nepal has transitioned into federalism structure since 2016. So in relation to information system, uh, we are currently following the Nepal Health Sector Strategy of 2016 till 2021. And it spells out to improve uh, the viability and use of evidence in decision-making processes at all levels with some key outputs. And there are also currently nine information uh, system so of these nine information systems, uh, we are working uh, especially in strengthening HMIS and uh, the HMIS data is currently entered in DHIS2 platform. So let me walk you through uh, the DHIS2 history in Nepal. So it was first initiated in 2016 by Honorable Minister of Nepal and uh, uh, from 2017, it was rolled out in subnational level. And in between 2017 and 2019, all the data which was entered in uh, data legacy was entered in DHIS2 uh, system. So from uh, 2019, it was then rolled out in local level and other health facilities. So what SSBH activity is currently doing? So let me give you a brief of the activity. It is a USAID uh, funded program of five years cooperative agreement uh, led by APT Associate Inc. and partnered with other three organizations. The major counterparts are the government uh, representing from three tiers of government. And the main is group by improving access to and quality of maternal, child, and reproductive health services with a specific focus on newborn care. So uh, we can see there are three outcomes and the cross-cutting priorities is the generation and use of evidence. So it is very critical to know that uh, uh, what number of reporting units are there in case of uh, generating and using the evidences. Uh, so in Surkhet, uh, uh, there are currently uh, nine parent facility this, this facility are uh, representing the local body, uh, five municipalities and four rural municipalities. And uh, there are currently 118 health facilities uh, and also uh, the private sector, 24 private sector uh, are, um, you know, that they, are, they are having access with DHIS2. So uh, DHIS2 reporting uh, units uh, to integrate those private sector. Currently, uh, the activity is also working to integrate those private sector in DHIS platform. So looking at overall uh, the numbers of reporting units in Sukhe district, uh, we found that the majority of the reporting unit is from Sukhe. Uh, it contributes uh, around a few 16% of total provincial reporting. So how SSBH is conducting uh, the activity related to the usage of DHIS2? So these are uh, the different approaches. Uh, first, we conducted an assessment, uh, like local level capacity assessment was done, a training need as it was assessed, and on basis of this assessment, customized technical assistance was prepared. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, different uh, kind of capacity building plan was implemented. And on basis of the data quality outputs like timeliness, data consistency, uh, completeness, uh, uh, on basis of this finding, again, the local body was supported uh, with the, the implementation. So this process took, like this was uh, assessment was started from January to June, 2016, and from two, uh, 2019, sorry. Uh, and from 2019 onwards, the implementation is ongoing. So this is the local level capacity assessment findings uh, info, uh, relating to information management and uh, review system. So here uh, there are altogether 11 domains that we assess to interview with health section chief and representatives. So uh, here we can see that one of the local body only have a legal and policy framework regarding health information system. However, the other indicators like uh, the capacity building guideline formulation conducting reviews, strengthening feedback mechanisms, most of the health system indicators and governance indicator was found to be poor. But very interestingly, the reporting mechanism was already there um, when we started this uh, assessment. So this is the capacity, uh, health facility level capacity assessment uh, in relation to information system. There are four domains we checked. Uh, most of the health facility have recording and reporting tools, but uh, 
The other three domains, uh, it needs to be improved. Uh, it's very less, a very less number of health facility that you really uh, check on the data quality. They, they do not uh, conduct the reviews and analyze service statistics and use of data and information for programming was also very low. And uh, this is the capacity building plan. Uh, these are the five criteria we uh, took into account. Uh, those are internet availability, DHS2 reporting system, computer and laptop availability, trained HR in DHIS2, and electricity, electricity availability. So be, on basis of these, we, uh, you know, we found uh, uh, who, which health workers from which health facility needs training. And after the training was provided, we updated their seat uh, along with the health, faci health facility uh, updated uh, uh, information. So after these assessment findings, uh, the activity prepared a customized technical assistance um, emphasized on use of DHIS2, although there were also other team customized technical assistance plan. First, uh, our, priority was, our priority was to emphasize on training. And then uh, secondly, uh, we also developed mentor and on-site coaching in selected sites. And uh, third, we linked DHIS2 reporting with RDQA. Fourth, we did a dialogue with the public health service office and also with the local level health section on usage of evidence for planning and capacity building. And fifth, we did a dialogue at local level to formulate health actions, health act and policy. So even though this is uh, the governance indicator, it was directly linked with uh, formulating monitoring and evaluation framework. So these activities was conducted to improve the use of DHIS2. So we found a uh, very encouraging result. Uh, result number one, there was an increase in health facility reporting rate, uh, meaning that in 2019, the most of the parent uh, facility uh, from the local level, uh, which is, is shown in the bar, the yellow section, these are the parent facility, they were reporting on behalf of health worker uh, from the uh, health facility as an end user. But uh, in 2000, 21 May, we found that those parent facility were not reporting and uh, the facility itself as, a, as an end user uh, were reporting uh, during this time. So uh, we can conclude from this uh, finding that uh, the health workers were more capacitated to, uh, to uh, enter the data in the HIS2 platform. So result number two, there was increase in reporting, timely reporting rate, uh, this very interesting figure. Uh, we found that uh, the reporting rate was only uh, 52.4, but it has increased to 77.4. And uh, as we progress uh, uh, in, uh, in 2021 with the months, uh, we can see that 83.9 is the reporting rate currently. So um, uh, this is the result of uh, uh, in the interventions that I mentioned uh, that we did on-site coaching to track the reporting status using DHIS2 platform. And also during uh, the monthly meeting, uh, reporting status was shared with all the health workers and uh, feedback mechanism was also used for providing immediate feedback uh, through DHIS2 platform. And besides that, we also used other social platforms like email, messenger, Viber for immediate feedback mechanism. So result number three, uh, in, uh, there was improved in data accuracy through RDQB, routine data quality assessment. Uh, when we conducted this assessment, we verified different indicators. Uh, in the 21 health facilities and the data was corrected on basis of these findings. As you can see, uh, there are many uh, highlighted with uh, the pink color. These are uh, the data which needs to be corrected. So it was corrected uh, from the health facility level. So one uh, good example that I, I, I'm happy to share is there, there was also an improvement in uh, documentation of pathograph. Uh, the pathograph is the clinical decision making tool by used by uh, the nursing staff during the delivery uh, to uh, save a newborn and the mother's life. So uh, what we did, uh, RDQ was conducted uh, uh, wherein we um, verified the cases, SPICE cases, and uh, we, we found that there was no any documentation done uh, regarding the pathograph used by the nursing staff. So uh, the activity itself, uh, we uh, supported to conduct on-site coaching uh, to correctly plot the indication in pathograph and um, the local level uh, decision maker also, uh, they decided uh, to release the delivery incentive only to those health 
health facility who filled the partograph of each delivery case. So the, the result was very astonishing. It was, the partograph were initiated in 100% of delivered cases thereafter when we followed up and it, and it is still uh, ongoing. And uh, the, the health uh, facility where we started this intervention, uh, the, the decision maker also replicated this activity in other health facilities. So the number four result was there was increase in the skill board attendant delivery. Sorry. So uh, uh, in 2019 and 20, it was 20.4, which increased to 40.5. So uh, the the it was the result was achieved only after uh, conducting uh, the SBA uh, training. So uh, in uh, relation to this, I will show you uh, the other. Yeah, this is the evidence sheet that we uh, used. Uh, first, we retrieved this data from DHIS2 platform. And then uh, we uh, we try to check which health facility uh, do not conduct SBA delivery. So there are uh, four health facility, uh, but among these uh, only three health facilities we choose because uh, the Kanita CHU, uh, they, they were not having the birthing center uh, facility. So three health facility was choosed and those health worker uh, from those uh, health post was given training. So very interestingly, we also, uh, uh, we also observed there's a significant change. The number has increased and uh, on the right hand side, like the delivery by non SBA at facility has decreased. So I have shown in the bubble map that uh, for those health uh, post we where we conducted the, the SBA delivery training, uh, the non SBA delivery uh, number was also decreased. So some challenges that I'd like to share while using DHIS2, there's still untrained health workers in a new established health facility, and uh, there is also existing non reporting health facility. Uh, there's a transfer of trained uh, staff and mentor currently uh, in uh, the in Sukit, uh, and uh, among the end user, there's a mindset that uh, they are, they only need to learn about the data entry uh, while they come for training. And uh, also, uh, besides that, uh, those who are already trained, there's a lack of use of analytics features. So a recommendation that we would like to put on is uh, we need to prepare a capacity building plan, and it it needs to be updated. So frequent on-site coaching is also needed for the mentor and health workers. Uh, national language uh, user guide should be developed uh, to use DHIS2 functions. And uh, there is also a need of allocation of uh, adequate budget uh, to strengthen health information system, uh, not only from the local government, but also by the provincial and the federal level government. So uh, uh, our ultimate aim is uh, to translate the, uh, the evidence into action. So the activity is continu continuously working on it. And uh, so far, we have achieved uh, uh, some good practices that I've shared. And we are also hoping to share uh, good practices of using DHIS2 platform in uh, coming days. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank uh, the entire team of uh, strengthening system for better health. So with this, I come to the end of my presentation. So uh, the floor is open for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yangtze. Again, I think uh, we will go through with all the three presentations first. So please post your questions in the chat or in the, in the, the community practice uh, page. So then I think uh, in the interest of time, we just move along to Emily Yelverton and Mitali Ayangar. Excellent. Sharing now. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. And again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Emily and I are really excited to be in the session and to tell you a little bit about um, what Datakind has been doing in this space. Um, Emily, who will be presenting this work, is a data scientist and DataKind's technical lead. And I'm Mitali, and I manage DataKind's portfolio of data science projects um, focused specifically on strengthening frontline health systems. So in these brief 15 minutes, we're going to present a novel approach to evaluating the impact of health interventions based on program data that's actually housed on DHIS2. Our hope really is that this presentation sparks a conversation, a curiosity, or even a collaboration. So we'll pop on our contact details as well at the end of this deck. And of course, you can always reach out to us via 
Twitter and our uh, website as well. And just to let you know, our colleague Caitlin is also in the audience. So if you're popping in questions, uh, she'll be there to, to help respond fairly, uh, fairly uh, quickly. So DataKind has been in the business of bringing people together to co-create transformative data science, machine learning and AI solutions for social impact for nearly a decade. I think we consider it one of our chief responsibilities to stick around to make sure that these solutions are indeed adopted and impact is achieved. So over the last two years, we've taken our vision of success further. We strive to innovate on how we might use data science and AI to not just solve individual or bespoke needs, but really to support entire sector level problems. And I think that's what's at the heart of DataKind's impact practices program, which is um, with the work we're presenting today is actually a part of that. And essentially, it's about creating solutions that work for multiple actors within a sector that exist as global goods and contribute to bringing about genuine desired sector wide change. We've been thinking about data maturity, data ethics and data science opportunities to strengthen frontline health systems for over two years now. And we're really excited to share this with you all. We came to the sector with the recognition that it is data mature and there is a large volume of digital data. And in a large part, that's due to the widespread implementation of DHIS2, which has overcome many challenges in fragmented or inconsistent data collection uh, processes in um, low resource settings. But we still had to ask, what are problems in frontline health that are data sciencable? And we found that out by asking a lot of people DataKind engaged in over 100 conversations across the frontline health space, and we heard the spectrum of uh, problems, you know, that run, you know, just the entire gamut of, of challenges. But on synthesis, we determined that data science problems that needed to be solved can be broken down to increasing access to digital data, increasing trust in their digital data, and increasing the use of their digital data specifically to gain timely, reliable, and actionable insights. And it's particularly around that fourth area that we wanted to explore alternatives to traditional mo modes of intervention evaluation. And so given the expansion of DHIS2 and the global community working on it to manage digital health information, we were able to explore computational methods for estimating the intervention impact using um, data housed on DHIS2. And that's how we've created some opportunities for continuous and more regular intervention evaluation at multiple levels within health systems. I'll actually hand over to Emily now to tell you more. Thank you, Dolly. We'll now turn to the technical part of the talk in which I'll discuss one method that can be used in a low resource environment to attempt to estimate the impact of a particular treatment program or intervention. No one here is a stranger to the difficulties of executing an RCT, the considerations of study design, the time and money costs, the reality of fitting it in alongside day-to-day -day operations in a facility. All of these are huge barriers in low resource settings. And that's not even considering the ethical implications of an RCT. After all, how do you decide from whom to withhold a potentially life-saving treatment? And when you're trying to measure the impact on an outcome that's relatively rare, the problem gets even trickier. All of this speaks to the need for an easier, less resource intensive, but still scientifically valid way of evaluating an intervention's impact. No method or model is perfect, but synthetic controls is a relatively easy to use and easy to execute tool to include in your analytical arsenal. It can also be run on a laptop and does not require big data infrastructure or parallel computing to implement. The difference and differences approach is a relatively straightforward and simple tool frequently used in economics and health context to get to the answer to a similar question. What is the impact of a treatment on a treated group? We assume that the treated group, here represented by the B points on the graph, follows a similar outcome trend to the control group, A, which did not receive treatment. We also assume that the treated group would have continued to follow that trend in the absence of treatment. Then the difference between the treated pre-post change, so B2 minus B1, and the control pre-post change, so A2 minus A1, that difference of differences is attributed to the estimate of the impact of the intervention on the outcome variable. However, difference in differences has a fairly strict requirement that parallel trends I mentioned in the previous slide. 
In other words, in order for the method to yield the most reliable results, the method requires that the outcome variable trends for both the treatment and the control groups were the same prior to treatment. And that's a very difficult assumption to meet in real life data sets for a variety of reasons. Poor data quality, missing data, and the on the ground reality of trying to implement an intervention in a health facility while also carrying out day-to-day -day operations, all of these factors and more are at play here. The synthetic controls method relaxes that parallel trends assumption by forcing parallel trends through weighted averages of the treatment variables. In this example from health economics, synthetic controls is used to try and determine whether or not the passage of a tax deduction led to an increase in kidney, no kidney donation rates in New York State. The dotted line represents synthetic New York, in other words, a control forced to follow the real New York's outcome trend prior to the treatment or tax benefit. The difference between the trend of the synthetic counterpart and the trend of the real life treated units outcome variable is then attributed to the effect of the intervention. In other words, the dotted line represents a projection of what the donation rate would have been in New York State had the deduction not been passed, while the solid line represents the actual donation rate after the legislation was passed. The result was an increase in donation rate of about two and a half percent. So now we'll demo a use case specifically on DHIS2 -like data. We will quickly cover data prep, the allocation of treatment, and model results. So for this specific use case, I used the DHIS2 sample uh, Sierra Leone data set that I installed uh, locally on a Postgres database. If you have access to a particular DHIS2 implementations web platform, it would be easiest to use the pivot tables feature to export monthly or quarterly data for specific data elements and your facilities of interest. However, if you are a comfortable coder, it's possible to use R, Python, or your analytical language of choice to connect to the DHIS2 API and programmatically retrieve your data. Specifics of how to do this are out of scope for this particular talk, but if you are familiar with the API, this saves the step of manually retrieving and exporting your data and can help make your analysis more repeatable if you're interested in running it more than once to track results over time. So using the DHIS2 data model as a framework we simulate four years worth of sample data from 2017 through 2020 for monthly live births in facilities using a Poisson distribution with mean parameter lambda equals 100 and monthly occurrences of babies born with low birth weights, also Poisson with mean of five. We chose this because a lot of count data falls under this particular distribution. The end result is an average rate of low birth weight of about 5%. Data are then aggregated by quarter in an attempt to smooth out the monthly variation in births and low birth weight counts, which is common when working with relatively rare outcomes. In our example, note that while there's little difference in the rate of low birth weights prior to intervention, uh, and this was done on purpose since deliberately selecting facilities based on their outcome variables can have confounding effects, Parallel trends are, are not observed here. And after the start of the intervention, the treatment facility's rate of low birth weights appear to be trending downward. And there's a clearer difference between the rate for control versus treatment facilities. But how much is that difference? And with what confidence can we say that this apparent decrease is due to the intervention? So here's a slide with some sample model results. And in this example, the plot shows the average effect for all treated facilities of the treatment on low birth weights post intervention start. The x axis time relative to treatment equals zero indicates the start of the intervention for low birth weights. The y axis represents the estimated impact of the intervention on low birth weights. The outcome variable was transformed via the natural logarithm for input into the model, and this is something that's, that's fairly standard for models whose outcome variables are rates or counts. So in order to get the estimated impact in terms of percentages, we reverse that transformation by exponentiating the model estimates. The results appear to show a steep drop of about 25% in that first quarter of the intervention, followed by an increase that's still an overall negative change, followed finally by a leveling off. The average negative change across the post-intervention period is about 16.6%. The gray shaded area represents the confidence interval. Note that it includes zero, so a strict interpretation of these results implies that the decrease in low birth weight is not statistically significant yet. This does make sense though. After all, interventions can take a long time to show conclusive results, particularly in health outcomes. 
In the end, however, it does appear that low birth weights are directionally improving in treated facilities. It's also worth taking a moment to discuss why there might be an apparent initial drop in adverse outcomes followed by a rebound. This could be for several reasons. It could be because of a drop off in treatment adherence over time. It could also be due to variations between facilities. Patients in the treatment program started going to other facilities or vice versa. It could also simply be due to better reporting. Better training facility means facility staff are more able to recognize danger signs. And in the past, the adverse incidents were actually going unrecognized. It is also possible to see results for individual facilities. Here's an example plot that can be generated from the model results. The red line represents the outcomes for one facility and the blue line represents another. Both facilities appear to see a decrease in the targeted outcome variable, but at different magnitudes. The blue facility sees an increase in worse outcomes upon intervention start, followed by a steep drop later on, while the red facility experiences a steep drop at the outset of treatment, followed by an increase, but the overall impact is still positive. So in other words, the incident of low birth weights appeared to fall. As of the sixth quarter post-intervention, the blue facility had an overall average decrease in adverse outcomes of about 10%, while the red facility's average decrease was around 20%. Uh, so that was a very quick few minutes and we covered a lot of ground. So uh, in my last couple of minutes, I would love to recap a few very important points from this talk. So the synthetic controls method in summary is a relatively lightweight way to test for the impact of an intervention. It relaxes some assumptions that are required for difference and differences, making it easier to use in cases where the outcome variable is uncommon. The overall average effects, as well as the individual treatment unit effects can also be extracted from the model results. But as always, careful examination of your baseline data and selection of treatment units to avoid potential confounding effects is critical. Uh, and most important here, local context matters. Models don't solve everything. Talk to providers on the ground and understand how your data is collected for best results. Providers know things that analysts don't. Uh, and lastly, but not least, uh, we do believe that this method improves on difference and differences and can be applied in environments with constrained resources. And we encourage everyone here to join us in continuing this research. Uh, if you would like to learn more uh, or are interested in recreating the sample analysis or trying it with different parameters, I have made my sample code available uh, on GitHub, uh, which you can see in the link in the slides. And we will also try to make this presentation available following the conclusion of the conference. Uh, and uh, if for whatever reason you cannot find the slides, please email me or Mitali or Caitlin and we would be happy to, happy to connect with you. Uh, so again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be able to speak with you all today. We really appreciate the opportunity and please feel free to reach out to me, Mitali or Caitlin, if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emily and, and uh, Mitali and Caitlin. A very interesting uh, uh, presentation. I have some questions for that, but we'll, we'll get back to that. I'll, I'll give the word to Louise then for the third presentation, the third and the last presentation of this session. Thanks very much, Johan, and thanks to the co-presenters as well. Um, I completely agree, context matters. And so I hope that what we're going to present uh, now will in some way link with um, both Yangtze's presentation about Nepal and also um, um, Emily and your colleagues' presentations. So um, we're, I'm going to talk about some research that wasn't directly on um, DIHS do data, but it was a, a research that was about data that may be going into DIHS2. So a bit different from the previous two speakers, but I hope you can see some connections. So I'm going to present uh, every newborn birth study, why, what was done and what was found. And I'm presenting on behalf of a, a large team, uh, names all on this slide, under the leadership of Professor Joy Lorne, is the principal investigator at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And if you look carefully somewhere in here, the advisory group, you'll find jo Johan Sabo. So just also acknowledging his contribution to this work. Um, uh, firstly, why was the EMBIRTH study done? Um, the study is about improving data for newborns to end preventable deaths, 2.4 million newborns dying each year in the world and more than 2 million stillbirths. And the Every Newborn Action Plan, Strategic Objective 5, is to improve measurement 
And WHO had a, has an imp uh, ambitious measurement improvement roadmap that's currently being updated and Ian Berth to linked in with that roadmap to try and uh, uh, create evidence to overcome data gaps. We were interested in core indicators rising up through the center of the data pyramid shown in yellow here, aggregated data from routine registers that might be feeding into electronic HIS, such as DIHS2. Um, and the core indicators, which are all on this slide, uh, there are many of them, but there's increasing consensus that these are the important ones for newborns around impact coverage and input. And the Ian Berth study was looking at particularly about these coverage, uh, but also um, outcome indicators for newborns in born in facilities. It was very much a collaborative design and project with research partners from ICDDRB in Bangladesh, Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania, and Golden Community in Nepal, um, and London School, as I've said, under Professor Joy Lawn's leadership, uh, but linking also with the UN and other, um, other data interested people. So the aim of the study was to assess validity of measurement of selected newborn and maternal health indicators in hospitals to inform prioritization and selection for use in routine health information systems. And we also looked at population based survey as a comparison because that's often used for national and global tracking currently. Um, the protocol is in the public domain now, and it, as I've said already, it was a collaborative um, effort, including uh, data experts. What do we do? Well, we have four objectives. We want to look at numerator validity, denominator validity, content and quality of care, but also the barriers and enablers to data quality. We've been hearing through the DIHS2 conference this year, and I'm sure in previous years, about how data quality is so important. And we wanted to specifically look at what are the barriers and enablers to that data quality. Newborns are cared for in many places in hospitals. We looked at three of them, the labor and delivery ward, the kangaroo mother care ward or corner, and the neonatal ward. And today I'm just going to present some of our results and uh, signpost you to where you can find other results if you're interested to dig deeper. Uh, researchers in Bangladesh, our colleagues at ICDDRB, designed a customized Android based tablet application to collect the data in time stamp way. Our research colleagues in Tanzania led the qualitative work and also the kangaroo mother care indicator. And our research colleagues in Nepal led the neonatal resuscitation as well as the experience of care indicator work. So starting with uh, how accurate were the numerators and denominators? Um, how do we, what do we do? Well, we used an external gold standard um, to do criteria validity and work. And we compared what was observed to happen with what was measured to happen either in survey or in register. And the research was carried out in five public hospitals providing comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care, two hospitals in Bangladesh, one in Nepal, two in Tanzania. We think of it like a, a, a triangle. So at the top in, in the gold was the gold standard. The results I'm presenting today are just about observed. So the practice or the intervention was observed by the research team. And then that was compared to shown in blue here, what was being written in the routine facility register data, the um, data that's usually aggregated around the time of birth to go up into DIHS2. And also that same observation compared against what the woman reported when she exited the survey after discharge. What do we find? As I've said, the results are published um, in the public domain now. Um, and there's a overall validity paper and also a supplement with 14 papers, each um, linking to individual indicators and care practices. Uh, I wanted to show you a picture of my colleagues uh, who did the research, uh, including the analysis. And these are the lead authors on these 14 papers. Um, and as you can see, we, we looked at coverage and quality indicators, measurement systems, outcome indicators, and also experience of care. Um, probably the easiest way if you want to look further at the, our results is to go onto this website um, because there's nice videos as well of our researchers sharing what they learned as a result of doing this research. On the labour and delivery ward, what do we find? We observed more than 23,000 births, among which nearly 7,000 were caesarean sections. And we looked at three indicators, 
uh, well, we looked at more, but today I'm just presenting three. Firstly, eutrotonics to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Secondly, early initiation of breastfeeding. And thirdly, neonatal bag mask ventilation. And in the figure, the uh, gold colored point is what was observed to happen. So you can see for eutrotonics, very high coverage of that care practice. Um, in purple, yeah, we, show, we show what the survey um, captured, so under-reporting. And uh, for the, in blue, we show what the registered captured. So again, under-reporting, but with wide confidence intervals. For breastfeeding, the coverage of breastfeeding in the first hour of life was very low, surprisingly low. Um, and you can see that registers hugely overestimated that, as did survey. And for bag mask ventilation, newborn resuscitation, um, obviously, this only happens for a very small number of babies that don't breathe after they're born, but registers more accurately captured that than survey. Interestingly, when you split by mode of delivery, we see that uh, being born by cesarean section affects the care you get, but it also affects the measurement of that care. So it's something just to bear in mind when we uh, do our analyses and think about um, not pushing all births together, but maybe thinking about stratifying by uh, mode of delivery, cesarean or vaginal birth. Um, the second uh, set of results I present today is about kangaroo mother care. We observed 840 mother baby pairs um, and happy to say that very high rates of kangaroo mother care were being observed in these uh, kangaroo mother care corners and wards. Register underestimated that um, slightly and survey women could accurately report that they were giving kangaroo mother care to their babies. If we put all the results together um, using some ratios, so ratios of survey to observed, where, where one, is, um, what, one is accurate, what we want. If you look across these five hospitals um, and then also pooled results here, um, you can see that in some hospitals uh, for some of the um, uh, the indicators, uh, there's good accuracy by survey or by register, but overall there's a lot of work to be done to improve data quality. Um, so this is the survey results, just the same, I'm just blocking out the register so you can see the overall pattern of survey, uh, but we're really interested in routine data at this conference, so that's what we're going to focus on now, uh, looking at the uh, routine register data for these interventions. So. Some hospitals, some indicators are good, but as I've already said, breastfeeding has a long way to go in terms of data accuracy. Um, if you look at the supplement, you'll see other papers that describe other interventions. Um, and um, we found, I mean, in gen, sort of generalizing our results, uh, we acknowledge that survey is really important for estimating population-based contact coverage. But once you start uh, looking at individual clinical interventions, it's very hard for women to report things that they may not have seen or that are complex interventions that, uh, you know, it's not really fair to be asking mothers what happened. By contrast, registers, which are filled in by health workers, are really important source data for more than 80% of global births now, which are in um, now in facilities. Um, with, we, so registers can provide the data on the clinical interventions, but as you've seen, data quality really varies. So there's work to be done to standardize register design, filling and flow into national routine information systems, um, and that requires some implementation research. So looking very briefly at content and quality of care, our third objective, I'm just going to give a highlight of birth weight here. Um, using those same ratios, I think you can see for birth weight, actually registers really outperformed survey, very high accuracy of birth weight in these registers, both for low birth weight and normal birth weight babies. This is really important because there are more than 20 million low birth weight babies born each year. There's well-known problems with birth weight heaping, but routine registers in these hospitals were very complete and very accurate. Most babies were weighed within an hour. There was less heaping for digital than analog, although digital scales were only used for 15% of those 23,000 births. And we found more heaping at nighttime. So again, just as we heard earlier, context matters and even context over the day night period matters. Stillbirths uh, were not weighed all the time, uh, which again was an interesting finding. So uh, routine data, accurate for birth weight, but we do need to invest in those digital scales. Um, and we also did a lot of work on the timing of these interventions. Bag mask ventilation should be started within one minute, but you can see from this uh, quality gap analysis that actually that was done for very a very small proportion of the babies who received the intervention. They just weren't receiving it quick enough. 
and that uh, highlights um, places where quality improvement can be focused. On to the barriers and enablers um, to routine reporting. Why are the data have different quality in different contexts? So there's a lot of uh, worry about this, lack of trust in data quality, and that's impeding use. Um, so these registers, which are the usual data source in these settings, have potential, but what's, imp what's impeding the um, data use is the quality. And as I've shown already, we had highly complete data, implausible values were also rare. Um, however, um, the accuracy varies. So just looking at those uh, high, this is just eutrotonics, high coverage of the intervention, but in those different hospitals, different capture in the register. Bear in mind that these two hospitals have exactly the same register, as do these two hospitals, but look at the difference in register uh, data capture, really showing that the data environment, the data culture is affecting use. And when you pull them all together, you have wide com confidence intervals. So this part was qualitative research. We interviewed health workers, but also our data collectors um, with in-depth interviews and focus group discussions to ask them um, what was the barriers and enablers to them filling in these registers. So it was a multi-country, multi-site analysis of these barriers and enablers. Um, the first finding was these: all these registers are, are uh, in each country, the register is different. Um, and in uh, the Nepal register, actually, the coverage of care indicators were not um, were not captured. Um, the register design, some of them had specific columns or non-specific columns, such as drugs given, and you could write any drugs. But as I said, some registers didn't even have a column for the intervention, and the instructions and conventions varied. In addition, there were many other documents in which those interventions had to be captured. So uh, some of these labor room registers had 58 columns and, uh, and in, on other wards, the, uh, the, the, the registers were very, even more variable. Here's just a picture of some of these registers varying from these highly structured registers with such as the 58 column one um, to these handwritten registers, which I kind of uh, call user design. It could change each week or each page, depending on who, who sets it up. We found a very, um, uh, uh, we, we found across all our settings, the same uh, themes emerged that were either acting as barriers or enablers. And they fell around these three buckets of register design, register filling and register use. So regarding standardization, nurses told us that sometimes I have to add columns to include data I know is important for the monthly report because the register doesn't have it and I would uh, miss it and that would be a challenge. Regarding time, a nurse told us in an eight hour shift, if I have a large number of patients, I may spend more time in documentation than the time I spend in attending the patients. So this is a big ticket if the care is being affected by the documentation, that's, that's important. And regarding regist register data use, um, feedback, nurses told us, I haven't got any feedback from HMIS about documentation. There is a monthly meeting in the hospital with data people, but we don't usually participate in that meeting. So unlike surveys, which have set questions and filling um, processes and standard training, registers, by contrast, are, have, are not standardized and there's very limited training to, to, to filling. So what next? We can't wait for the data to be perfect. We need to start using registered data by increasing those feedback loops and um, linking to improved data quality, um, linking to standardized registers, thinking about cesarean section births and understanding through proper research, how can we improve data quality and use at the register level? We found that having blanks in, in uh, leaving uh, intervention not done as a blank was very confusing with calculating completeness. There was clearly way too much duplication and burden on health workers um, and uh, interventions that involve an element of timing, such as breastfed within an hour, were particularly poorly, uh, poor, had poor accuracy. And again and again, I keep mentioning this fact that we don't have a standardized register. So what next in measurement and research? We, we're involved now in uh, phase two of this project, which is um, linking register data up the, up the data pyramid in colleagues uh, with, in Bangladesh and Tanzania uh, uh, participating in this research with data for impact and funded by USAID. And it's a collaborative two-year feasibility implementation research 
uh, capitalizing on the momentum of EM birth phase one, but really looking about uh, indicator uptake in the system. And we're hoping to design uh, some tools or perhaps a toolkit to enable other high burden settings to look at the data elements they need to have the right indicator measurement uh, and drive that improvement of data quality in their countries. So we've got five objectives um, and very happy to talk with people afterwards about what we're doing. Um, but uh, EMBIRTH phase one focused around the data quality around this part of the data pyramid. And EMBIRTH phase two, we're really thinking about uh, going up the pyramid through all these steps of data aggregation and summary forms into your um, electronic uh, information systems such as DIHS2 and thinking about that data flow and feedback, particularly for newborn health. Uh, we think the tools need to be based around three buckets, tools that about using data, tools about mapping data and tools about data quality. Because at the moment, the 90 countries of ENAP, Every Newborn Action Plan, they can't report on the coverage of these high impact evidence based interventions that newborns in their countries need. So we really our dream is that this table would turn green, that countries would know what's the care that these newborns are, um, are receiving and be able to drive change towards improved um, quality and coverage of care. We all know that valid data alone will not save lives. It needs to be used by professionals, policymakers, governments to invest in healthcare for newborns and women. And uh, whilst cesarean section rates continue to rise, we need to think about how that affects our measurement. Um, but <laughs> there is a lot of data being collected and it's honoring to midwives who collect that data to use that data now as we continue to try and improve data quality overcoming those barriers, including increasing feedback between the HMIS levels um, and understanding what specifically can be done from an evidence um, perspective, which is what this session is about to improve that data quality. So I just want to thank again my colleagues and collaborators in all these countries, thanking SIF, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation for funding phase one and for USAID for funding phase two. Um, and yeah, look forward to conversation and uh, questions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, so we have, I think uh, we'll take five minutes for, for questions. I see there have been several questions in the chat for, for uh, Yang Si, and she has uh, answered them there. Feel free to post more questions either here or in the community page where we can, we can keep them uh, alive beyond this session. Or raise your hand. Um, that's a feature on the reactions in your Zoom task bar. Any questions for any of the presentations? Yeah, we have a hand from Elaine Byrne, please. Hey, thank you. Thank you all for very interesting presentations there. One question I, I'd like to ask just really is about sharing the data from DHIS2, um, particularly with kind of organizations outside the health facility. And really, are there kind of data sharing agreements? Or I know Emily mentioned that it was on a, a kind of trial data set, um, but maybe, you know, the others can respond to, you know, how do you access the data or is it in partnership with people that are working there who have access to the data anyway? I can answer specifically for Datakind's perspective. Um, so Datakind does have data use agreements with partners who are working um, in the field, um, either directly with the, the Ministry of Health or with program uh, organizations who have a restrictive level of access to DHIS2 to do the work um, that we've been doing on this. Um, for those do have um, very limited use policies, so um, such that we, we couldn't share those results publicly, which is why the demonstration our team put together was on the trial data and um, as a demonstration of the methods um, uh, for a standard data set. Thank you. I see there's a question from uh, Suleiman. I think both uh, raised his hand and, and written it down in the community page. Please, Suleiman. Okay, you can hear me. 
You can hear me, please? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, I have a question for uh, Luis. Uh, I want to know how do, you, uh, do they organize all the team for the studies about the lead? Is there the MOH or the university? And the other question is, uh, uh, did they set up another server for the survey or it was the same national instance used for the survey? That uh, this is the question for uh, Luis and uh, for uh, the first presentation uh, about Nepal. Uh, is the RDQA forms implemented directly in DHS2 in Nepal? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Do you um, want to go first, Luis? Yes, thanks so much, Solomon, for a great question. Um, so, yes, we linked with researchers in the country. ICDDRB, IFACARA, and Golden Health, uh, Golden Community in Nepal. And, but they worked really cl closely with the Ministry of Health. So there was very much that kind of, uh, what can I say, that vision to be working uh, not just as standalone researchers, but really embedded with the, the real world, if you like. Um, so yes, that was how we did it for, the, for both EM both phase one and phase two. Um, and yes, we did um, set up a separate server actually for this study for EM birth phase one. In birth phase two, we're trying to link much more closely with DHS two. So for the survey, we did uh, we base our questions on the typical DHS mix uh, questions, and um, but we didn't use their platform. We 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 had our own um, we had our own server partly because we were actually also trialing out questions that don't yet exist in those surveys, um, like kangaroo mother care, or in fact most of the interventions don't exist. So we couldn't really use their platform because it wasn't set up. Yep. I hope that helps. Thanks. Thank you. And then I think uh, Yang Si, the, the last question, if, if you go to you, and I think we, we draw the line after that. Yeah. Thank you, Suleiman, for your questions. I tried to address the chat box, uh, but let me explain. Uh, uh, currently, uh, the DHIS2 already have a function of data quality. Uh, there's, there's one uh, section there. So we can operate that uh, to find the data quality issues. So currently in Nepal, uh, uh, since RDQA is conducted online, uh, online and uh, also the offline, it depends on the provinces, what kind of function do they prefer? So uh, I think in DHS2 platform, uh, currently the RDQA is not embedded, but uh, uh, in RDQA tool itself, uh, there, there used to be uh, a verification of recording and reporting tool only, but now um, in the province that I worked, uh, we tried to address the, uh, the DHIS2 data entry since it also have uh, issues, you know, the entry in the, during the entry, they, um, the user do entered data uh, which is not correct with the recording uh, uh, and reporting format. So uh, we try to uh, include the DHS to enter data also in the RDQ waveform in the offline version. Okay, thank you. Um, I think yeah, we are running out of time. So just like to thank then all the presenters, Yang Sharpa, Emily Elverton, Mitali Ayangar, and Luis Tina Day. Uh, and of course, all the all the participants. And since we have the community practice page, um, I I uh, really encourage you to to use that for any further questions and for the presenters to just uh, drop by that page and, and and answer any additional questions. Thank you.